curiosity. That's where the person should be saying, Whoa, what's this? What are you talking about here? Get them thinking. Number three, you must stimulate, stimulate felt need. Stimulate felt need. Now, her felt need was water. But then you must move it to the fourth stage, which is to surface real need. That is, box three, she wanted water. Box four, she wanted a savior. And the link between three and four, the link between three and four is extremely important. Three is where your class is. And box four is where, you're, where the teacher wants the, the class to be. Box number five is when you finally begin to teach the content. That is, you satisfy real need. And that is your content, your class. Let's see if we can't summarize that in seven principles on the next section called need maxims. Maxim number one, as you'd anticipate, is need building is the responsibility of the teacher. There's a great quote by M.J. Beryl. It reads, a teacher is not simply one who imparts knowledge to his students, but one who awakens their interest in it and makes them eager to pursue it for themselves. He's a spark plug, not a fuel line. The question I want to ask you is, who puts the bait on the hook? The fish or the fisherman? When class begins, what we typically do is we expect the students to come to class motivated. Like all week they're thinking about, you know, we walk into class <clears throat> and we say, nice to see you. Uh, <clears throat> please open your, your Bible to Hosea chapter 6. Everybody all week has been waiting for Hosea chapter 6. I mean, they can't wait to hear what you have to say. What, that, what is that? That's the brass hook. The other side to say it is, I need to get the fish to Hosea 6, but uh, the Super Bowl just got over, and I probably can start there. And I'm going to start here, and in about three minutes, they're going to be dying to know what's in Hosea 6, because all of a sudden they're wondering about their need that I help them surface. Need building is the responsibility of the teacher, not the student. Number two, need meeting is the teacher's primary calling. Would you please star that? Need meeting is the teacher's primary calling. What do I mean by that? Let me ask you a very thought-provoking question. Does the Bible have a need? Does the Bible have a need? Does the Bible have a need to be taught? This has no needs. This is a book. Books have no needs. Especially the book from God, which is complete and perfect, has no needs. Therefore, this book has no needs. It doesn't have a need to be taught. Who then has the need? You have the need. Somehow we think as teachers our basic responsibility is to explain what's in the book and hopefully the Holy Spirit will help meet the need in your life. So we start with this and we hope somehow it helps you. Rather than realizing the exact opposite is the truth. You have a need. You're the one who has the need. Nancy has a need. God set me here as a gift to meet Nancy's need. And I go back to the book to find the answer to Nancy's need. Nancy doesn't come to class thinking about her need usually. So my job is to grab her attention and make her curious and start to help her feel the need until finally she's saying, oh man, I wish I knew how to fix that problem. You mean you have the answer to the problem in the scriptures here? And there's three things I need to do and that problem will be solved. Oh, man, tell me it. 
Somehow, every one of these laws is like this, friends. We're going this way, and we think it's the right way. Then we stumble on some passages in the Bible. We turn around and say, oh, God really wants me to do it this way. I was talking to a pastor friend one time, and we were at a pastor's conference, and I said, uh, how you doing? He said, not very good. Church is kind of plateaued and going down. And he said, what do you think? And I said, I think it's your fault. And he said, you think it's my fault? I said, well, aren't you the shepherd of the church? of the sheep and you're telling me your flock's not very healthy it's not having more lambs it's not growing that's your problem it's not their problem so what's the problem he said I don't know so what are you preaching on he says I'm preaching on Galatians I said you having a good time I'm having the time of my life really I'm teaching verse by verse word by word I'm getting into the Latin the Greek the Hebrew the French the German I'm having a wonderful time I've always wanted to do this I mean I'm going so deep I'm plumbing the depths. Said, no kidding. How long have you been preaching on Galatians? Two and a half years. <laughs> Two and a half years. Uh, just kind of curious, what chapter are you on? I'm on chapter 2, verse 1. <laughs> you enjoying it? I'm loving it. But attendance is kind of going down. Huh. I wonder why. I don't know. So let me ask you another question. What's the big idea of Galatians? Well, what do you mean? Why did God write Galatians? Why is it in the Bible? Well, you know that. I, I know that, but you know it better than I do because you've been studying it for all these years. You know more about it than Paul knows about it. <laughs> Tell me, what does it mean? Well, the big idea, he said, is that you're not saved or sanctified by works. I said, that's right. That's the big idea of the book? Right. I said, Pastor, let me ask you another question. How many of your people think that they are saved or sanctified by works? Well, none of them. Well, then why are you spending two years telling them something they already know? Why are you teaching Galatians? Well, I'm teaching Galatians because I'm preaching my way through the New Testament, book by book. Why are you doing that? What? Why are you doing that? Well, that's what you're supposed to do. Really? Where does the Bible say you're supposed to do that? Show me one verse that even hints at that. Go ahead. I'd be interested in knowing why you're doing this. Well, I'm sh I don't know, but I'm sure that's what we should do. Really? What did you preach before Galatians? Well, 2 Corinthians. I'm not going to ask you how long you spent on that book. <laughs> I said, in other words, you're preaching through the books in order? Right. I said, Pastor, let me ask you a question. Which book was written first, Galatians or 2 Corinthians? Well, Galatians was written before 2 Corinthians. I said, right, you're out of order. <laughs> if God didn't tell you to preach it, in order from book to book to book and he didn't inspire the order of the books because he didn't the next issue you want to ask is how did Jesus Christ do it himself that is when Jesus Christ met somebody did he start in his own mind saying I have this content to teach and maybe I can apply it to you or did he always start with the need of the person first and then give them the answer second so pastor what did Jesus Christ do because I've studied every single time Jesus t taught anybody. And some of you have as well. What did he do? What's the answer? The need first, then the answer. Somehow we think, let's give the answer and hope somebody has a need. We think we're a teacher rather than a physician. Sick. Medicine. I may dispense it to you. My friends, the major reason God has you here is to meet your class's needs, period. It is not to teach the Bible. And the difference is as different as night and day. If I think my job is to teach the Bible, then I'll do it a certain way because I'm working my way through the whole Bible. If, however, I think my job is to help meet your needs, then all of a sudden I'm going to start paying attention. Where, where's your problem? How can I help you? And what's the answer? And my friends, the difference is revolutionary. But you've got to go back to the issue that that's your calling. It's your calling. Well, let's give the next one, number three. Need building is the teacher's main method to motivate students. Need building is the teacher's main method to motivate students 
students. So many times I feel we teachers are like this man who's on our class, represented by the horse, trying to get him to go in this direction, and the horse has his eyes out for that apple. And the horse wants the apple, which is his need, and the teacher's trying to push him in this direction. Well, eventually the, the class gets frustrated, and so does the teacher. So the teacher cajoles and pushes and argues and debates and threatens and uh, gets really after the class. And all that class wants is some of their own need being met till finally, out of a deep sense of frustration, the class says, I hate this class. And the teacher sits down and says, I think I'm not called to be a teacher because I can't get my class to do it. And then the proverbial apple hits the man on his head and with a stroke of genius, he takes the need of the horse and leads him to where he wants to go. Always take the class's needs to take them where you want to go to teach them. If a class isn't motivated, my friends, what's missing? What's missing? Yes, an abate that's appropriate to the class. So if it's not working, what should you, what should you do? Change baits. How many fish? Yeah. If one bait's not working well and somebody down the end is doing it with live shrimp and you have a lure, if you have any sense at all, what will you do? Get some shrimp. <laughs> Why? They're biting on. Now you can take your lure and yell at the fish. Come on! Come on! Bite it! With your stupid lure. It's not the lure's problem. It's that you haven't got the correct lure with the fish. Next. Number four. Need motivates to the degree it is felt by the student. The degree in which it's felt by the student. The point isn't whether you like the lure. The point is whether or not they like the lure. Whether or not they're motivated in their own mind to go after it. Next. Need building always precedes new units of content. New units of content. Before you give a new series or a new talk, build the need of the people. How much should you build it? You should build it till they feel it. Like maxim number four says, need motivates the degree it's felt by the student. Carl Henry, who was one of the greatest uh, scholars in Christian circles, said this. He said, I had a good philosophy teacher who refused to give us answers until we literally hurt with the questions. Unless the class is dying for the answer, don't give it to them. Isn't it interesting that Jesus Christ says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Fishers of men. If you've ever been fly fishing, you can really picture how fishing takes place. You take a long pole and kind of a thick uh, string with a real fine one with a little tiny um, fly at the end. And you start, uh, you get up to about this high in either a brook or a lake. And you start flicking your line and then letting more of it out and more of it out till you got it, oh, a good 20, 30 feet away. And you pick a spot that's kind of underneath a tree and it's kind of stopped and you start saying I'm gonna hit it right over there and you lay it down and then you pick it right off why get the attention of the fish what was that I don't know it's gone dog on it gone you say to yourself next time it's mine you lay it down all the time the fish is saying I want that I want that looks so good I hope it comes back again and it bites it a good fisherman hides the hook. A good fisherman hides the hook. You shouldn't know that I'm building your need at any time. There's no, there's no way you should say to yourself, he's motivating me or she's motivating me for the lesson. The adept fisherman, you can't see the hook. You'd never guess there was a hook in it. The more adept the teacher is, the more that class is thinking to themselves, boy, I can't wait to hear that. I really need that. And they came in thinking things totally different. Why? You learned how to draw them to the...